Um, good evening uh, here in Australia. It's evening. I'm speaking to you from Australia. And um, I'm speaking to you for a very relaxed society where we have not diagnosed one new coronavirus infection for the past two months. Uh, and uh, it's, it's an advantage to be an island, even a big island in the South Pacific, but it's also an indication of what happens when you follow public health advice. I'm, as Morgana said, and, and um, sorry, I meant to say uh, greetings to Morgana, the wonderful Morgana, to Pavel Bem, to Michelle Kifatsky, and to the parliamentarians, and to everyone else on, the, on the, uh, this extraordinary webinar. Uh, I am, uh, as Morgana said, the Executive Director of the Global Law Enforcement and Public Health Association. This is a relatively new association that was set up to promote the role, the potential and actual role of police in achieving public health goals, which to many people sounds strange because to many people in many sectors, the police are antithetical, police behaviour is antithetical to achieving public health goals. But in fact, even though they're left out of the public health workforce largely, police have an enormous amount to offer. Um, as Neil Woods, who will follow me, will bring to your attention uh, the facts that criminalisation of drugs not only does not work, it, it does not achieve its stated aims, but it is also hugely contra counterproductive, causing far more harms than it prevents. This is not to ignore the fact that the war on drugs and criminalisation of drugs actually does serve to the benefit of some vested interests, but for society as a whole, it does not. Many people take many different sorts of drugs. I would say most people, if not all people, take different sorts of drugs for many reasons. And it has always been so, and it always will be so. My morning coffee, my blood pressure medications, my evening brandy and dry, all are normal parts of a normal life. I don't have problems with my drugs. And the simple fact is that most people, as has been said tonight or today already, most people who use any sort of drug at any time don't have problems with their use. I learned a lesson. I was running a workshop in the early 1990s in southern China, um, trying to work with public security and public health to bring them together to deal, to address the issues of, of drug use and harm reduction and the, the, the incredible epidemic of HIV that was occurring at that time, where we ran a, a week-long workshop with public health and public security officials from all around China. And... Um, uh, the public security officials came from celebrating National Drug Control Day, in which there are public executions of low-level drug traffickers. Uh, and they uh, celebrated each night at this, at this meeting by drinking enormous amounts of uh, a rice wine spirit called Motai, which is a 55-proof alcohol, the most deadly drug I've ever, ever seen. And I pondered this, the fact that people were being executed for being involved in um, what is pharmacologically a harmless, a relatively harmless drug, that is heroin, and celebrating with one of the most potently dangerous drugs I know, which is, is, um, is Motai. The problem is, generally, as a society, as many societies, the problem is we look at the drugs. All day to day through this seminar, we've been talking about the drugs. It's been pointed out that there are many other issues we should be confronting, but it's the drugs that catch our gaze. We look at the drugs and not at the people. I've been working in, in the areas of harm reduction and drug policy reform for more than 35 years in many different ways. And over that long career, the more I look at drugs, the more I see people. It's a simple fact that the people who are having trouble with their drugs are having trouble with their lives. Mental health issues, poor socialisation, adverse childhood experiences, sexual and physical abuse, discrimination and stigma, unemployment and homelessness. These and many more factors lie behind problematic drug use. Problematic drug use. As I emphasised, most people use most drugs most of the time without problems. We get it backwards. We say that drugs cause people problems. Ban Ki-moon, when he was Secretary General, talking about Afghanistan, said, until we solve the problem of drugs in Afghanistan, there will never be social economic development. And I said, you've got it backwards. Until there's social economic development and there's meaning and purpose and, and, um, and uh, security in people's lives, they will always be dependent on drugs. 
research conclusively shows, and my research and many other people's research shows that young people who have problems with drugs, whether you call them addicts or dependent or whatever term you want to use, have had major problems with their lives well before they started their drug use. This, the growing science around the impl implications, the impact of adverse childhood experiences, multiple adverse childhood experiences predisposing uh, people to all sorts of uh, adverse social outcomes, including problematic use of or dependence on drugs, is, is unchallengeable. The, reason, the reasons then for using drugs, why young people start to use drugs, include easing the pain of an existence that is sad, of, uh, to find acceptance within a social circle where, they, where they've been rejected by family, school and society. My own research with young people and why they began injecting, why they began using heroin, going back to the, uh, in my case, to the early 1990s, looking at, at, at young people within a short time of starting to use, showed that their lives had been, um, had, had been severely impacted well before they turned to the drugs. It wasn't the drugs causing their, their, their problems. Certainly once they become dependent, the drugs continue to in, in, in increase the problems, but that's largely because of society's reaction. Um, boredom and meaninglessness, and meaninglessness I would emphasize as being a really major cause of why people end up having problems with drugs. Another simple fact, the thing that prevents people from, from especially young people, from developing problems with their drugs is having something in their lives which is much more meaningful whether it's close and supportive relationships, whether it's useful and rewarding job and career, whether it's a religious commitment, it's different for different people. But having something in their lives that is meaningful is the, protective, the strongest protection against having problematic drug use. We have to recognise that we make drugs the focus of our policies so that in order that we don't have to confront the real issues that are facing young people. If we can convince ourselves that drugs are destroying our young people's lives, then the answer seems to be simple. Get rid of the drugs from the young person, from the society, and all will be well. There's several things wrong with this belief. First is that we can get rid of the drugs from society or from the young person's life. If we don't acknowledge, concentrate on, and respond to the real issues that are undermining their ability to have a meaningful life, and, and, and the issues that are making them turn to drugs, then they won't stop using. If we don't invest in meaningful family support, uh, education, meaningful education, employment, training, job creation, social welfare, and all the rest, then our society will just continue to produce young people without futures for whom drugs are one of the only recourses. I can't tell you the number of times in my research when I ran across the phrase that this young person had failed school. And I turned around, oh, no, the school failed the young person. The young person didn't fail socialisation. Society failed the young person. The second reason why the belief is not right is it doesn't work. If we do manage, if we did by some sort of magic uh, spell, manage to get drug, rid of drugs from society and from the young person's life, all the conditions that led them to the drugs in the first place are still there. And the person is still suffering. And they're suffering from what are major public health issues, some of the biggest public health issues our society faces. Some acknowledged, unacknowledged public health issues too, like loneliness, but I would include meaninglessness up there as, as, as a very major um, public health issue. Instead of treating people in these situations with a public health response, large sections of already disadvantaged communities, as others have said tonight, and thirdly, what we in fact end up doing is making things worse. We are very good at making things worse. We're much less good at making things better for disadvantaged communities. They're not disadvantaged by accident. They're disadvantaged because of social processes that disadvantage them. And we're not good at challenging those social processes. Arresting someone for drug use, sending them through the courts and to jail, doesn't make them less likely to use drugs, as has been said before. It makes them much more likely to become involved in crime, uh, more involved in crime, as well as their drug use. I think it's a sobering fact that in almost every society I've looked at, the strongest predictor of a person's risk of going to jail 
is having been in jail before. In other words, go, uh, jail and detention has done nothing to change the person's life except for the worse. We operate on the assumption that making something criminal under law will remove it from society. Not only does this not work, it's not true. As Neil will show, it makes things worse. Police are there to enforce the law and the law is there to, to, to protect us. But what does it mean when the law does not achieve its objective and police are forced day after day to carry out activities, stop and search, strip searches, arrests, court appearances, all the rest of it, that not only don't work, but make things worse. Every police officer will tell you about the revolving door, arrested one day, back on the street the next. The police job involves looking at short-term results. A crime has been committed, we need a response. Police generally do not ask whether that immediate response has good long-term long effects and outcomes. They take it on trust. Somebody else has decided that if this is uh, something we want to get rid of, make it illegal, get the police to enforce the law, it will go away. It's not their job as far as police are concerned. Well, I would argue very strongly that it should be their job. Police are there to contribute to the safety and well-being of all members of society, all of, our, all of our communities. And if their actions are not helping or even making things worse, which they can see day to day, they should be encouraged to speak up, to see it as part of their job to educate and lobby for change. They should be an integral part of the public health team, working with all the other sectors to bring about effective change in people's lives to assure safety for everyone, because after all, safety and security are the basis for health and for a healthy society. There is indeed a movement that is increasingly going on around the world. Increasingly, police agents, agencies are adopting a public health approach to policing, being informed by understandings of the trauma and adverse childhood experiences which have brought people to where they are and where, which have brought them to coming into contact with police, especially young people who are having trouble with their drugs. Increasingly, police are partnering with public health and social welfare agencies to find better ways to cope with these public health issues than through the criminal justice system. Any police officer who's been in the job for any length of time and has had his or her eyes open will tell you that criminalise something will not make it go away. Not while there is a demand that is not being addressed by social policy, and while there is an enormous profit to be made by criminals, a part of which, the profit, is used to corrupt the systems meant to be preventing the trade. Until we decriminalise drug use and until we change our focus from the drugs to the life circumstances and opportunities of young people, we'll go on making things worse, as we have been doing ever since the war on drugs was declared. Decriminalisation doesn't mean we've lost the war on drugs. It's the sole and necessary precondition for winning, our young winning the war for our young people. Police are too often seen as the enemy, and in many instances, <coughs> they are indisputably so. Um, killing of unarmed black people in the United States, uh, corruption in a number of countries. But there are many police who are allies, real and potential. The Global Law Enforcement and Public Health Association has had produced a statement of support by police for harm reduction, which was signed by over 10,000 police worldwide. A statement of support by police for drug policy reform launched in a commission on narcotics, narcotic drugs by Neil Woods, by Morgana. Uh, uh, there are lots of police who want to do things different, who want to see things different. They make great advocates, as you will see when Neil speaks. Reach out to them, is my advice. Find them as allies, make them allies, because they are potent allies. Uh, work with them as key public health um, organisers. And anyone listening to this, or in, uh, listening to this, uh, this um, conference, please, if you know police who are interested in doing things differently, please put them in touch with me or with Neil, and they can join a, a, a growing global community of police who are trying to uh, make a difference and... Um, promote humane policing as part of the public health effort. Thank you.